Today I'm going to be going over direct and indirect inguinal hernias. The first thing I'm going to do is have a pretty high level top down approach and then kind of go from there to the different layers that are involved each type of hernia. Starting off with the different anatomical landmarks in the region, you have your rectus abdominis here, your inguinal ligament here, your femoral artery and vein here, and two branches of the femoral artery and vein, the inferior epigastric artery and vein here. A direct inguinal hernia will actually happen here in what is called this Hesselbox triangle, which is bordered by three different landmarks that form that triangle, that rectus abdominis, that inguinal ligament, and then these vessels here, the inferior epigastric vessels. So this is where the direct hernia will occur. It's medial to these vessels. An indirect hernia will actually occur lateral to these vessels, more upstream here. Another way I think about these two is this is more of a brute force approach coming through the direct anterior abdominal wall here. And this is actually using a preformed path that we'll go over a little bit later, but it'll follow this rheumatic cord. Moving on to here, this is also another way I think about what rings are involved, and then physical exams surrounding how you can tell the difference between the two. An indirect inguinal hernia, which we've talked about what happened here, actually will pass through both what is called the deep and the superficial inguinal rings. Remember, if you have an, a, some contents from the abdominal cavity, they have to get out through all these different layers of fascia, and so it's going to get through the deep and the superficial inguinal rings. These vessels that I denoted here are actually corresponding to the inferior epigastric vessels here. As you notice, again, this is lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. The direct hernia, I've noted, notice, you might notice that I've drawn this triangle, which shows that it's Hesselbach's triangle. It moves through Hesselbach's triangle and also through the superficial inguinal ring. So what I'm saying here is that both the direct and the indirect hernias pass through, pass through the superficial inguinal ring. Only the indirect passes through the deep inguinal ring. The direct will um, pass through Hesselbox triangle. So this is kind of a different way that you can tell on physical exam. If you're doing the standard herniation test that your doctor would do with the turn and cough, um, you're going to be feeling for both of them here. If you want to find out if it's direct, I want you to move upstream, lateral to the inferior epigastric arteries here, and I want you to have them cough. Or if you want to do the direct, I want you to move your hand here and have them cough, kind of go into the side of origin, and that's where you can really get the difference between the two. So now let's go over the layers that are involved with the direct and kind of get a little bit more of the anatomy involved. The direct is fairly simple. I've shown it in this diagram here. What I've shown is a piece of bowel pushing directly against the peritoneum, which is your first layer, and against what is called the transversalis fascia here. These are the two coverings that will cover a direct hernia, and it's using its brute force to push its way through those two. That's pretty simple because there's the only two layers involved for this kind of herniation. For an indirect herniation, on the other hand, it's going to be quite a bit more complicated because a few more layers are involved. So let's walk through this step by step. In, in, during indirect herniation, you're actually going to follow this preformed path with the cremisteric cord. A lot of times it's congenital in origin, and you'll have some peritoneum that is actually extending down into this pathway um, where the, the spermatic cord is going. What I've shown here is the question mark. Basically, this, this solid line here, the peritoneum going down to that cord, is denoting an indirect inguinal hernia. The question mark is actually showing what would be normal anatomy. The peritoneum is not actually extending down into that canal. As the spermatic cord travels through different rings, it actually picks up different layers of fascia. I kind of think of each of them giving something to it as it passes along. So as you have your bonds deferens and you have your... Um, your arteries passing down, they're actually not inside the peritoneum, they'd be coming down. You're going to get covered by your transversalis fascia. They're going to um, actually go through the transverse abdominis, which will skip over them and form the deep inguinal ring. They're going to get something through in the internal oblique, and they're going to get something from the external oblique, which is now an aporesis at this point. To, sh to show you what all these three different things turn into at this, the level of the spermatic cord, let's move over here. The external spermatic fascia actually comes from the external oblique aponeresis. The cremisteric muscle and fascia, remember that muscle that will contribute to the cremisteric reflex, will actually come from the internal oblique. The internal spermatic fascia will come from that transversalis fascia. And then what I've noticed here is where the normal presence of the, the testicular arteries wouldn't be, along with the von's deferens. They're not in the peritoneum, notice that. And then I've also drawn, in an in indirect inguinal hernia, you will have this peritoneum as a result of something called a patent process balance analysis. Notice that only three, these three outer layers are normal. This layer is abnormal and is present in an inguinal hernia. It's passing through a preformed channel and carrying with it, or actually already using, ex, um, abnormal peritoneum 
to uh, herniate those bowel contents. So now let's move on to the last page here and think about this some more. I talked briefly about the fact that indirect inguinal hernia uses a preformed pathway, but I didn't really mention to you that it's, a, it's pretty congenital in origin. And so what I mean by that is that, um, let me get this a little bit more centered for you. What I mean by that fact is that, um, is that you have, in some kids, what normally, I mean, what normally happens in adults is that, or what normally happens is that you have your peritoneum, it actually extends down to the testes, you have this process of vaginalis. Over time, it should regress. You have two distinct pockets of peritoneum here and here. This is the tunic of vaginalis, which actually covers the testes. It's normal. You can think of it, think of it as a tunic or a cloak surrounding the testes. What will happen in an abnormal situation would actually be what I've shown here. Um, if you maintain the process vaginalis, you're going to have this abnormal peritoneum. That's going to form a pathway for the intestines to herniate down through the deep and through the superficial inguinal ring. And the, what this little circle means here is that they're actually using a patent process vaginalis. That peritoneum never fully closed, and then your tunic of vaginalis is still here. So that's a quick high-level overview of both of those. I want to just hammer home a few more points. So remember, all inguinal hernias pass through the superficial inguinal ring. Only that indirect passes through the deep inguinal ring. It uses that preformed pathway. The direct is medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. The indirect is lateral to those vessels. The direct is commonly acquired, so you get it during life from activity, etc. The indirect is frequently congenital because of this patent process vaginalis. And the indirect is more common. It's about two-thirds of the time versus the direct, which is typically only one-third of the time. Thanks for listening.